Hello there, my fellow tank commanders, and welcome back to our series on famous battles and campaigns in Warhammer 40k. For today, we arrive at episode number 5 in the Kaladar War. Previously, our hero, Captain Bannock, was fighting on for dear life against an orc inside of his baneblade, the Mars Triumphant. Fortunately, he came out on top in that. Today, we're gonna deal with the aftermath of that attack and what the Imperials did next. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? While the Honored Captain Hannock led several squads of guardsmen and even several tanks to the relief of the Seventh Company, the fighting continued. The Magnificence, the Command Leviathan, was still in the process of being cleared of the last surviving commandos, when the army's logistic support went to work, assessing all the damage. The orcs had ensured that the Hellhammer would be out of commission for the foreseeable future, torching the inside of Hanik's command vehicle with incendiary devices. Effectively, this reduced the Seven Paragonian Super Heavy Company to half strength. As the engine seers of the Adeptus Mechanicus began to work on the Ostrakhan's rebirth, the Paragonian officers were quickly joined by the remaining crew of the Mars Triumphant. They carried dire news as well, because apparently the Orc's main objective was not the assassination of the Imperial High Command or the sabotage of their tanks, but a kidnapping instead. Another detachment of commandos, the biggest and best equipped of them, had attacked the quarters of the Adeptus Mechanicus, killing their sentries and seizing Adept Brasslock, the chief engine seer of the Seventh Company. And so, in the wake of the Orc attack, Captain General Ishkandrian called for an emergency meeting in the Magnificence's command center, the so-called Chamber of Strategies. The mighty voice of Commander Uftera filled the Leviathan's command deck demanding updates on the damage done by the orcs. The commandos had indeed struck the Magnificence hard. The big explosion that Bannock had felt while exiting the vehicle had been a sizable armor-breaching charge, which had destroyed the Leviathan's right track, effectively immobilizing it for the time being. One of the fortress vehicle's three main entrances had been destroyed, and the orcs had planted two bombs inside expertly eliminating the Leviathan's means of communication too. Fortunately, its astropathic choir had not been hit, for now that was the only way for Ishkandrian to coordinate his army. Led by a still irritated honored Captain Hannock, the officers of the 7th Paragonian Super Heavy Tank Company joined a meeting. Opposite them were five preachers of the Adeptus Ministorum. Standing at a high bronze lectern, Two Tempestus Scions standing behind him, the Captain General addressed the gathered crowd. Over the commander of the Imperial forces on Kaladar, a cyber cherub wept at the most recent list of casualties. The officers were quick to realize that some of their number were no longer there. Colonel Gemmel, responsible for setting up the camp, was one of the absentees, as were Tulligan and Ostilek another two senior commanders of the Atraxian regiments. As the Captain General would reveal in the opening lines of the speech, all three had been incarcerated and they were awaiting their trial. The charge levied against them was a treasonous inability to adapt. Gemmel especially had the reputation as a hopeless dogmatist, one who firmly believed in the tenets of the Tactica Imperium. Gemmel had even ordered several of his troopers executed for voicing their concerns that the orcs might outsmart their patrols and perimeter defenses, solely because officially the Tactica Imperium stated that the Greenskins were incapable of stealth and guile. In that respect, Ishkandrian and Gemmel were actually alike, but Ishkandrian was ruthless enough to sacrifice one of his underlings to safeguard his own career. Without acknowledging his own shortcomings, Ishkandrian promoted the leader of the Paragonian regiments, General Lo Bastine, as his second in command, before letting sanction psyker Logan continue the briefing. For those that had been present at the banquet, his report held precious little that was new. The orcs had a mighty psyker, one of their so called warp heads. This particular warp head had developed an uncanny mastery of his craft 
mastering skills that so far the Imperium had only encountered with the Eldar or the powers of chaos. It soon became obvious that the Orc Witch, or maybe another of its kind, had infiltrated the minds of the gathered officers previously, discreetly siphoning tactical intelligence. Hence the Kostovel rout and even the attack on their camp. The astropaths and the priests' efforts to shield the Chamber of Strategies from the Orc's prying mind suddenly became clear. Ishkandrian wanted to confuse the Orcs by entrusting his plan only to those that would be able to execute them. Those not privy to the plan's details were encouraged to feed the Orcs false information by thinking on the Orcs' motives for being on Kaladar to begin with. One of Ishkandrian's aides continued by revealing telling information. A long-range reconnaissance flight had been conducted by a specially modified lightning and brought back photographs of their principal objective, the fallen hive city of Meridon, now more commonly called Orc Town. The pictures revealed a vast construction at the bottom of the hive, believed to be a psychic amplifier fueled by great quantities of Lorelei crystals. Not only did the device considerably enhance the power of the Orc Psyker, but it also made Imperial astropathic communication very difficult, as well as providing the Hive with Omicron-level psychic shielding. In other words, the Hive was void-shielded to a degree that not even the orbiting ships could penetrate. Therefore, the elimination of this so-called Green Eyes, as they named the Psyker, and his Covenant of Shaman Witches, had become priority target number one for the entire Imperial war effort on Kaladar. To achieve this goal, the Captain General and his advisors had devised a highly unorthodox plan, involving all the remaining mobile assets of the Northern Army Group. Two formations of tanks and mechanized infantry would pass through the region of the Ozymandian Basin, a region that the Imperials wanted to avoid because of its large deposits of untapped Lorelei. These reserves of crystal in the basin were so potent that they prevented the region from being settled, causing the construction crews of the unfinished hive city of Kimeradon to slaughter each other in their madness. The Imperial strategists now gambled that the Lorelei deposits of the Ozymandian basin would also be able to shroud the formation's movement and the thoughts of the crews from the Orc Psyker. To further limit the chances of discovery, only the chief of the expedition, a Captain Exertaxes of the 121st Atraxian Mechanized Regiment, and the vehicle drivers would remain awake. The rest of the crews would be put into a three-day-long sleep, a hibernation masking their trail until they reached the heart of the Ozymandian Basin. By following a previously established list of waypoints, the formation was to circumvent Orktown's main defenses and strike directly at the Psychic Amplifier. To this end, each of the twin formation's sole super-heavy tanks were issued with special ammunition, Lorelei shells which were psychically charged. Having distinguished themselves on the raid on the Imperial camp, Honored Lieutenant Cortain and the Baneblade Mars Triumphant were chosen to act as Captain Exertaxi's second-in-command. All the non-essential personnel had been drugged to induce a 72-hour long sleep period during which their dreams would reveal very little to the orcs. As established, only the drivers would remain awake at their stations. Three days into the journey, the crews finally awakened, the storm still sheltering the formation from prying eyes. The Mars Triumphant, a company of Lehman Rosses of the 42nd Paragonian Regiment, and 50 troopers of the Atraxian Mechanized Infantry and their Chimera APCs, traveled in a single file through the desert of the Penumbric Badlands. Several Trojan vehicles accompanied them, carrying the expedition's vital supplies of Promethean barrels and ammunition on towed flatbeds, their journey scheduled to last a little over three local weeks. A lone Atlas recovery tank served as a transport for the formation's engine seer and astropath. These personnel were the only means of communication with the rest of the army, for the Lorelei crystal deposits were also creating a rogue EM field which rendered the traditional means of communication almost useless. Only focused infrared communication beams seemed to get through, and even those only on a short distance. Aboard each vehicle, the mood was grim. 
The crews had been told their ultimate destination only when they woke up, three days in. It was Orktown, the heart of the enemy. In the minds of all, they were on a suicide mission that nobody volunteered for. Conditions were also very difficult. Even two weeks into the journey, the sandstorm was still there, keeping the tank's crews confined inside. The dust of Kaladar gradually attacked the vehicles too, scratching the paint off the hulls and clogging the intake valves. The air became still and hot, the tank's interior system scrubbing as much CO2 as possible. They awoke stiff from being forced to sleep in a single position, as only the Mars Triumphant boasted its own moderate bunks in the tank's interior. Even when they slept, the Lorelei affected them, and many crewmen suffered horrific nightmares. Several minor incidences of violence between crew members were reported even before the column reached the truly difficult terrain of the mountains which were bordering the Ozymandian Basin. How they would brave that leg of the journey though is a story for the next time. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Kaladar War for today. I don't know about you, but I personally enjoy this less grandiose perspective and the focus on the individual struggles of the soldiers. It lends a bit of solidity to the story in my opinion. But what are your thoughts on this element of the campaign? Do you think this plan is gonna work? How would you have dealt with a situation like this, where the orc superpsyker can literally take your information from your mind? If you enjoyed the episode or thought it was informative, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end and I wish you all a great and healthy day. The Emperor Protects.